All right. Yeah, well, well, good morning, McPherson. It's great to be back home. I uh, appreciate KMU helping us borrow this. This is my second time in the facility here. I appreciate the great work that they, that they do and uh, working on some, some price issues, which I'll, I'm sure I'll hear about in a second. And I want to welcome our, we're doing Facebook Live as well, and welcome our folks on Facebook Live as, as well. Um, I'm really here to do more listening than talking. I'm a much better listener than I am a talker. And I'm going to start by asking you all a couple questions. Anybody here drive more than 30 miles to get here today? We got 30 miles. Anybody? 30, 30. How about over 60 miles? Over 45? Okay, so you three get the first question if you want it, okay? <laughs> so we'll do that. And as you're thinking about your question, I got my, my question for you all. How many people in the room think it's time to tear down the fence around the Capitol? <laughs> trying to engage my crowd here, what, what, what they're doing here. Uh, how, how many people think we have a crisis at the border? Okay. How many people, this is a trick question, how many people think that boys should be playing in girl sports? No. That's kind of what I was guessing, guessing as well. You know, there's, um, I'm getting ready to ask the question here. You know, I know most people wanted to hear me come in today and talk about uh, the, the royal family and Merkel and, and Prince Harry and stuff. But uh, I'm going to save that question for last and I'll try to circle back to it. <laughs> if you know what I mean. All right, all right, so first question, first, and, and you guys can have a comment, a question, I'm, I'm all ears, I'll try to repeat the question, or go ahead, sir. Well, I'm Dan Food, Davidson from Salina. I'm a better talker than the listener, so. <laughs> I'm going to grab a, I'm going to grab a seat. Yes, sir. So, so Dan's question, I think everyone can hear, he's got a good, good voice there, is about the executive orders that the president has done. So that this president, I, it's probably a multiple of two times what anybody has done before him. Um, I think it's a power grab. And I hope America's watching. I hope America realize, with all due respect to our president, he said one thing, but he's doing another. He said he was going to have a moderate platform, but this is part of an extreme agenda. I'm going to call it power grab. The theme I think that I've seen so far since January is a power grab, uh, and the executive orders are one way that that's happening. Uh, like you said, skipping the skipping the, the due process, killing jobs too. That this is killing jobs uh, across the across the country that his executive orders are doing right now. Um, what will be dependent upon is our is uh, attorney generals to start filing lawsuits, and they are already. I wish I could say, and here's the way to stop it, but I think it's going to be through the court system, our three legs of government. Okay? Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll circle back to you as well. Do you, you all have a question or a comment? I don't want to put you on the spot either. Uh, so I'm, I'm Rodney Ryan, I'm from Salah. I really just have a statement and a request. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to Joe, Man Joe Manchin and, and Kristen. Yes. Yep. And personally thank them for me to hold that line. Uh, I think that the filibuster is the only thing that's keeping this country, the country that I defended for 32 years. Okay. So, so thank you. So, so his question is about the filibuster uh, and how important it is, and I agree completely. The filibuster should force us to work together to get long lasting legislation. It forces the majority party to work with the minority. So what we're going to see right now is we passed tax regulation cuts uh, four years ago, three years ago on a partisan basis 
And now the Democrats are going to undo it on a partisan basis. So you're sitting there trying to run a business, plan a business, and if tax laws keep planning, it's really hard to plan your estate uh, or, or to run a business or you know try to, try to save for college for that matter for your kids. So I agree completely with you. Uh, and it's part of the power grab. This is the biggest power grab of all is getting rid of the filibuster. If we get rid of the filibuster, then they can do all sorts of things, uh, including changing our, our voting rights. Uh, they can make Washington, D.C. A, a state. They can make Puerto Rico a state. This would put Democrats in power forever. It turns, it, it turns us into a one-party system for all practical purposes. Getting rid of the filibuster, in my opinion, would turn this country into a one-party system as well. So anybody, anybody else who's got a question or a comment? Yes, ma'am. I have a question about farmers, okay. um, about the law that was just passed. It was very racial. Um, the money that was given to a farmer, but if you're white, you don't get that money. Right. Comments? Well, so, I'm gonna, so a question is about the last CARES Act, uh, some funding for farmers. So let me explain exactly what they did. Uh, and again, this is partisan legislation, not one Republican voted for it. Um, a person of color, any type of agricultural loan was forgiven 120%. Not 100%, 120%. So they gave a person of, a farmer, a person of color, 120% of their loans, and then they didn't even have to pay off the loan with it. They could just keep it if they wanted to. So this is reparations, okay? So again, don't watch what they say, watch what, what they do. And, um, and, and it, it's going to get worse, but this was the first part of reparations. It, I'm been open for a follow-up. So was it uh, part of it going, I, I understood a couple different things, like part of it, it was ran through FSA office, that that's how they got that money, and then also part of it was uh, to pay their taxes, is that? So the 120%, the, the 20 is to pay the taxes on yes. the money. Okay, so the government gave them, rather than just 100%, they gave them 120% to pay their taxes. And I assume it'll go through, through FSA, but I'm not, I'm not sure. But, but the money, the legislation is appropriated by Cong Congress, and FSA is just the messenger. How do, how do, how do farmers respond to that? What? Uh, by voting. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that you know, elections have consequences, but policies have consequences as well. And again, what President Biden promised us was a down the middle, moderate policy, but this is a very extreme, radical agenda that's coming down the pipe, it looks like to me. So I, I really expect the House to be flipped back to Republicans in the, in the in two years from now. The Senate is gonna to be tough, but I think it's possible. I think that the policies have consequences as well. I think that, that America is still a center-right nation and, and, and that, these, that these issues, whether it's the issue of life or whether it's transgender issues, election laws, I think that America does not want extremism and that's what's being thrown at us. So we respond by voting. Yes, sir. What are, what are the federal laws on the uh, interstate sales of natural gas in relation to the price of everybody in here? I, I think many people are surprised already, and certainly the, this and the unemployment issue, unemployment dollars coming from the state, the number one and two things that we're hearing about specific to Kansas. Um, so it's governed by, by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Um, we led a letter within days after this all happened saying, you'll look into this. And of course, they, they move very, very slow. So it would be through, through FERC, uh, we've also uh, tried to find some appropriated dollars. Some of the CARES funding that's already been sent out is to let communities try to reuse uh, those in, in different ways, including this as well, and increase funding for people that have that problem right now. And just would encourage you that if you're, when you get your bill, <laughs> you're, every one of you is going to be unhappy, that you could reach out to our office. There's two ways to do it. On the cards in front of you, you could call the office Monday and, and kind of tell us your story. Wait till you get your bill. And um, you know, take a snapshot of it and send it to us. Go ahead. Just for an example, I'm on the first college board, and their gas bill normally runs eight thousand dollars, and it's going to be over a hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, they have to—they can't buy through cans of gas service because it's apparently buying too much. So, so there's—I didn't even realize that they were buying it from some other utility. But, but the, that's what. 
I, I think that would be a, a piece of the puzzle. And I think to contact state legislatures, because I think the state of Kansas is doing things as well. And maybe you know, I saw Stephen Johnson was here that the state's doing some things as, as well. Stephen, you want to take a, just to kind of tell what you guys are doing? I don't want to put you on the spot. They, they heard from us. Before. Okay. All right. Okay. Good, good enough though. But I think everyone is going to get, it's going to, I'm hearing multiples of five and 10 times, times usual. And for the life of me, I can't figure out who made all the money on this. And so I'm trying to follow the money. Yes, sir. I will just say for the residents of the city of McPherson, you will get a $15 extra charge, which isn't that much for six months that will start running here soon. But for the college, for industry, uh, I don't know the answer to that, but uh, we just wanted to say for citizens to DPU, CEO, and DPU, that we 91% of our energy came from coal and wind during that cold spell, which was great for our community, and that the other 8 or 9% we were leveling that out for six months at $15 extra a month, which hopefully everybody can handle. So. We're very fortunate for uh, the residential citizens, but the college, some industries are, are, that had to buy on the market need to be talking to state and federal people. Pushing back. So, Mayor, thank you. And, you know, to your point, this is why we need an all of the above energy policy. If I describe the, the state of Kansas, 40% of our electricity generated from uh, wind, about a third of it from coal, 18% from nuclear, and, and the rest is well, whatever's left, right? <laughs> but this is an example of coal and nuclear saving our tails as well. Yes, sir. Yeah, and, and what saved us is our plants here were able to switch over to fuel oil, and luckily we have a, a refinery right on the edge of town and we went 24 hours a day, just continued clocks to keep on pushing us through that cold spell. And that's what the $15 a month for six months is going to charge uh, to get the fuel oil. We didn't have to rely on the gas. But if you had to rely on gas and buy on the market, it was a... Mayor, Mayor what does it usually generate? What fuel source is usually used to, for your plant? Uh, we, are, we are going to be using gas, but what, because of the situation, Right. We switched back to fuel oil, which we have the ability to do. Okay. And, and, the, and this is probably the best case scenario. I mean, your scenario here is multiples better than anybody, than most communities uh, in, in so many ways. And if it hadn't been for coal and nuclear, whatever your bill is, it could have, for most people, it would have been even, you know, another multiple above that. And I guess my question on that, oh. though, is the B multiple of fuel and the first deal pipeline yeah. being shut down jobs and everything else how do we keep a 300 year supply of coal and fuel oil and other things and all of this super green initiative that seems everybody is, is bowing down to right now uh, multiple sources is our salvation it would seem and that we're a, we're a community that represented that so absolutely, and to me it all comes back to an election, electing officials that agree with you rather than disagree with you, that I feel we had the tail wagging the dog. It's very, very simple. And you, I'm going to just start by saying I want to leave this world, this country, healthier, safer, cleaner than I found it. Growing up in El Dorado, um, our air is so much cleaner today. We had two refineries growing up. Our air is cleaner today. Our water is cleaner today. The nation as a whole at a 25% year low for carbon footprint, 14% uh, less the day than, than 10 years ago. So how about a little common sense? I think we all understand that we're gonna probably use less coal and convert over to natural gas. And I think that that makes sense to us. But, but the, uh, the concept that we're gonna be able to power this nation on solar and wind, I'm not convinced of yet. Um, and what frustrates me is people say follow the science, but I don't, I don't think we know the science yet. No one's talking about the carbon footprint of making a car, making an electric car battery. No one's talking about what do we do with the batteries when they're done? What's that carbon foot? What's that environmental footprint look like, like as well? Uh, so I, I think we need to look at the whole picture rather than just the, the, uh, the output from a, the tailpipe of an engine, right? So a little common sense, slowly turning the dial. What I see happening 
right now is that our energy prices are going to go up, up, up. Under the previous policies, we had gasoline prices of $2. They're $3 a gallon now. They're going to be $4. I was saying by Christmas time, but I bet we see $4 this summer as well. I think that you're going to see increases in your energy bills. I bet they'll be double a year from now uh, but just because those uh, they're, they're going to put hidden taxes, hidden regulations to drive up the cost as well. And that hurts middle America, lower income America more than anybody else. Senior citizens living paycheck to paycheck. The cost of gasoline, the cost of your electricity and energy bills at home are very, very important to you. So it's, it's frustrating to me to see this shoved down our throat. You know, specifically right now in front of us, President Biden's infrastructure bill. It's not an infrastructure bill, it's a grab your wallet bill. Okay? Only about 6% of it is going to be used for roads and bridges. So there's $110 billion in a $2 trillion bill, $110 billion for road and bridges, but $170 billion for electric car chargers. So almost 70% more to build electric car uh, generator, electric car battery chargers than compared to roads and bridges as well. So that's where this legislation is going. And then additionally, it's gonna raise your taxes as well. And I think hurt the economy. So that's what we have is that, that this is not the moderate policy that President Biden told the people when he was running. Instead, it's part of this radical extreme agenda that we're seeing that's gonna drive the cost of living up for, Ameri for hardworking Americans. So I think there was a common sense approach to all, to all of this, and then uh, that's the direction we should keep going. But let's go go to the back, and then we'll come up here. Okay. Uh, the question I have is, how do you uh, feel like there ever be another fair election? I know you said about the common sense. There's no common sense yes, sir. anymore. How do you feel about getting just a, like even old people at the voting places accountable, whether the military steps in or what? How do we feel like there could ever be another fair election? Right. So I, I feel very good about Kansas. I think that we had a safe, a fair election process here. And, and really what we need is other states to come up to our standards. And I don't think anyone thinks that our standards are radical at, at all. Um, the U.S. Constitution clearly states that the federal election should be ran and overseen by the state legislature. Okay, so the state legislature, if they, if they want uh, an ID, a voter ID, then Kansas can have it right now. But you have to realize what Speaker Pelosi's number one bill, HR number one, is to get rid of voter ID and then to legalize and promote uh, ballot harvesting. Her law would even keep Kansas. So it would be a federal law telling Kansas that we cannot have voter ID. But I think 80 or 90 percent of Americans want voter ID. And then let's talk about ballot harvesting. This is a concept that I, I had no idea people were out there cooking up these schemes, what, what ballot harvesting is. So if, if a state is sending out unsolicited absentee ballots, so if every person in Kansas got an absentee ballot, whether you were going to use it or not, you didn't have to show an ID or anything. So that ballot is going to go out to people that have died, people that have moved out of state. So the Democrats will be paying operatives to go out and collect those unused ballots and, and to go into a, a nursing home or to go into retirement homes and collect mass numbers of them and fill them out for them. You know, I'm sure that they're saying, here, please fill it out and I'll take it in for you, right? So that whole process is flawed. The whole process is flawed. Uh, so this law promotes ballot harvesting and legalizes it for every state as well. And then finally, here's the big kicker, that the, something nobody's going to like about her legislation, H.R. 1, her top priority. It's going to use federal dollars to match campaign dollars. So if somebody gave Nancy Pelosi a dollar, the federal government would give her six dollars. And I know you want more political ads, attack ads, come election time, right? <laughs> Using your tax dollars to, and it works both ways. If someone gave me a dollar, the federal government would give me six dollars as well. But, uh, but I just I don't think that's the way the election should work. Uh, sh she only wants to she wants to go just the opposite direction from what you're describing. So I think Kansas has a good plan. I think the Georgia plan did exactly what Americans wanted to do. They they required a voter ID and they're getting rid of ballot harvesting. I think that so it improves integrity and improves the value of your vote. I think what ballot harvesting does is dilute the value of your vote. You know, it said it said if someone's out there collecting 20 ballots. 
Uh, and you make the effort to go ballot at the, to go vote at the booth, and someone else is out there finds twenty, it dilutes the value of your of your ballot. Want to go ahead? Uh, do you think the Senate's going to get the pork out of that one point nine trillion dollar bill? His question is, do I think uh, the Senate will get the pork out of the the bill? I don't. I think that uh, this will be done on pretty much on um, partisan lines again through budget reconciliation. So there's only about there's almost one only one way the Senate can pass something without 60 votes unless we get rid of the filibuster um, is through budget reconciliation. So that's how they just passed the the previous two trillion dollars is on a partisan basis through budget reconciliation. They'll pass another budget and jam this down our throats as well. There's been no effort by the White House or the Democrats to, to ask for our input on anything so far. When the Republicans went, we had to beg to go talk to the president uh, and the 10 senators went. Uh, he listened politely, but all of his staff members behind him shake, shook, continuously shook their head, no, no, there's nothing to, to bargain about. So he'll shove it down our throat one way or the other. What about the uh, uh, back in the Supreme Court? Uh, we hear about there's going to be a uh, uh, group of people, Democrat and Republican, that are going to be involved in some kind of a, a committee uh, to uh, study that. Uh, do you see that, that coming along too? The, they will take it to the edge as far as they can. Um, so this is part of the power grab. This is part of the power grab. So if, you, if you're sitting there and you're a Democrat and you're concerned that um, there's more conservatives than liberals on the court and not enough people are going to die in the Supreme Court, what do you do? Well, let's go add four, let's go add six more liberal judges to the court to get things changed back your way. So that would be their goal. So now they're forming the committee and praying about it, as, as I would say. And, uh, I, but they're, they're already loading the committee. So the, the co-chairman of the committee that they're appointing, of course, is a Democrat operative. And it'll be, whatever ratio it'll be, I bet it'll be like six to two. They'll have six Democrats and two Republicans on this committee to study it. They've already read the report written. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm being facetious here. Uh, I assume they have the report written. But part of the getting rid of the filibuster, um, getting rid of 50 votes would lead to statehood for Puerto Rico. It would lead to statehood uh, to Washington, D.C basically setting us up with one party. Just the opposite of what our founding fathers wanted. And what, you know, so, so I, I'm, I'm very, I think this could be the, the, the biggest news of the, of the week anyway. Yep, so we'll have to fight that one tooth and nail. Part of an extreme radical agenda. Yes, sir. Okay, so several parts of the question and basically, you know, concern about packing the court, uh, the Second Amendment, and how we can push back on what we feel are unconstitutional attacks on us. So I feel like, like H.R. 1 is unconstitutional. It's, the, it's a power grab by the federal government. Trying to attack our Second Amendment is, is a power grab as, as well. And all, all I can tell you is I'm going to keep fighting to protect our Second Amendment. It's what protects the First Amendment. Thank you. And, and then, you know, the, I think the answer, again, is try to make sure we have a majority of Congress members elected that support the Second Amendment. And, yes, some of this would end up in a court system as well. And that's one of the ways the, 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 the governors can lead, lead as well. So, yeah, go ahead. President Biden said that he would not support vaccine passports. Okay. But we don't know about uh, the airline industry. We don't know about other industries, we don't know if our state doesn't have it, how that's going to affect us on a national level, because how can we have anti-discrimination laws in place so that people are not forced to get a vaccination, because that should be a personal choice. 
So, so our comment is about some type of a vaccine passport and just concern. Um, so I'm against them and I'm just gonna, I, I, I've not seen a good solution either. I don't see any, any long-term solution to a vaccine passport. I think we're gonna have herd immunity by the end of April or in May, and I'm hoping it's all, um, it, it, it's not even necessary. But I'm still concerned about people coming into this country and bringing us the virus as well. So I, I'm looking for a solution to that. Are we gonna allow people to come into this country without being tested? Yeah, go here, ma'am. So our question is, why doesn't the Supreme Court rule on some of these? So there's a system that somebody has to file a lawsuit, and typically it's our attorney generals, and then that goes up the, the ladder as well. And I think that we're seeing that happening, but it'll, it takes time, more time than I want to see uh, to get to the Supreme Court as well. Yes, sir. Uh, we acknowledge at the beginning of the problem on the border. Okay. You yourself acknowledge that as a humanitarian work, that you can see it as a problem. My question is, what is there a plan in either house to start working on this from a legislative point? I'd like to know what the plan is. Okay, so his comment is, is on the border and, and the truly the crisis it is, and is there a legislative fix? Um, I mean, to me, the legislative fix is to secure the border and fix a, a very broken immigration system. So I, I don't think that the Democrats have any interest in fixing either of these. They want the problem. We had good solutions on the, on the House floor, solutions that gave President Trump everything he wanted, asked for the $25 billion to secure the border, a plan that was made by DHS, included about 800 miles of wall, but it also, a lot of the dollars were gonna be used for uh, increased boots on the ground, increased technology, increased drug dogs, all those types of things. Uh, so no immigration plan is gonna work until we secure the border. But, but no, there, there's really no headway. Uh, whoever controls the gavel in a committee controls what we're going to talk about and if there will be any legislation advanced right now. So I see no appetite um, by the current majority of taking it, taking it on. Yeah, Follow Michael. Follow up on that same question. Much of the crisis, people are coming in. Wall is going to be built for a long time, so you've got to deal with the immediate crisis. The best way I can think of is get more judges in so they can process this immediately. Those that are eligible to stay in and those that are out. But letting the backlog stop for three or four or five years before you even get a hearing is ridiculous. And you get more judges and you can speed that process up and you can get all the bad guys out real quick. So, Michael, you make a great point. Certainly, I think more judges is part of the solution. But, from the, for, but here's my concern. Let's talk about the bad guys. So, in a given month, right now, about 200,000 people per month are being apprehended by the border patrol. There's another 400,000 that are slipping through, that aren't gonna get a hearing no matter what. So we are just overwhelming the border patrol, uh, what the cartel is doing, they'll load up a bunch of uh, women and children, load them, uh, throw them in a boat, bring them across the border, yell at the border patrol, hey, come get us. Meanwhile, 20 miles down the river, uh, the, the bad people are going through the, bo the border as well. Um, there's no one fix. You know, another uh, anecdotal s s thought here is the second President Biden was sworn in, the Mexican government stopped cooperating. It's much easier to control the southern border than it is the northern border. I don't know if we've got enough judges in the country uh, to handle 200,000 people crossing the border every, every month, but it's part of the solution. Yes, sir. With your colleagues in the Senate, do you believe you can stop an equivalent to H.R. 1? Okay, so, so his question is, do you think we can stop H.R. 1? As long as we have the filibuster, we'll be able to stop it. There are not 60 votes uh, to make it, to let it go forward, and they cannot put it on a budget reconciliation bill. So the budget reconciliation bill has to have something to do with the budget. So I don't see any way that they could get an HR1 into budget reconciliation. So as long as Joe Manchin stays steady and, and Kristen stays uh, steady, um, we'll be okay with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, Senator Tom Keyser, I've been hearing bits and pieces uh, from the federal level 
level, as this COVID dollars goes into the state level, that the federal level is trying to control as far as the tax the taxation that the states can, can do as far as increasing or, or reducing um, the tax base. And if you want to talk about a takeover, that is an absolute takeover my, from what I can see. If they're going to eliminate a state from tax incentives or, or whatever they want to do with this funding, Sure. So his question is putting limitations on the, all the, the uh, COVID funding going to the state level. And can the federal, how much can the federal government dictate or not dictate? And I, I just kind of feel like, you know, we're the, the dog chasing our tail right now. So, you know, just to back up, the last CARES funding, they took $400 million that proportionally should have came to Kansas and sent it to a blue state. So California and New York got disproportionately more than we did. And our share should have been $400 million more. So states that, sh shut, their that shut their economy down were rewarded for shutting it down versus Can Kansas was punished for our, our low unemployment employment rate. So that's the first part that, that bothers you. So once you give people money, you know, then how do you go back and manage it? So we gave New York so much money, now they're going to start giving money to illegal immigrants. So when you're sitting there at the, at the federal level, your congressman, your senator, and you're saying, oh, wait a second, the people of Kansas are already upset we gave $400 million more than we should have, and now we're seeing New York give it to illegal immigrants. And we see Seattle going to give people, I don't know, $1,000 a month or something like that on, on top of it. So you want me to manage your tax dollars frugally, but I agree with you, too, that I don't want to micromanage the state. So I don't got a, a perfect solution. And uh, in, in general, I would side on the side of, of um, not micromanaging a state what to do, do with it. But I don't see a perfect solution is, out is there. It, is it true that, that, that the Treasury Department or at the federal level, that they may have the capacity to pull some of that funding back if the state doesn't fall in, in, into the line? So your, your question is, can the Treasury pull it back if the states are... Um, don't do the right thing and I would suppose the answer is yes they could and but would they I don't know and it almost becomes more of a political driven answer than than the law because I bet the, the laws that we wrote for that appropriation are, are vague enough that the treasurer can do some mojo with it okay yes sir what are your views on this QAnon phenomenon okay. you know what are my views on the QAnon phenomenon um, you know, I'm not sure who they are. Um, I, I, what I, you know, I think what I'm in favor of is I think everyone should have, a, have their voice heard, but I'm against any type of violence, violence that we are a nation of law and order. And if they're an extreme group that pr promotes uh, white supremacism, then I'm against that. I'm, I'm in favor of everybody having an abundance of equality of opportunity. I think that uh, no one was promised happiness, but everyone was promised the pursuit of happiness. But if they're a violent organization, I'm against them. And I think it's hard to describe who, who exactly they are, and they are not. Um, but uh, but I, they, I, I think that um, we better keep an eye on them, and if they're responsible for violence, I'm against violence. Thank you. You bet. Yes, ma'am. And they're sending busloads of homeless and immigrants to the state of Kansas. I heard of some reliable poor source. And in Hutchinson alone, we were seeing there's a commute of homeless that lives in an area behind Walmart. We're seeing a lot more of that because the cities from Dallas, LA, wherever, are giving the homeless bus tickets to go to rural areas. Now, with that being said, we have a Democrat we have four Democrat, last time I looked, Democrat Supreme Court justices in our state, one nonpartisan, one Republican. How soon is the total flip going to go? We're in trouble. Okay. So, again, several questions in there to try to, try to repeat them. Um, question about sanctuary counties in the state, in the state of Kansas uh, as well. You know, I think the label of sanctuary county is depends on who applies it. But I think if you went to those counties and asked them, I bet they would say, no, we're not a sanctuary county. 
And so where do you draw the line to say it is or isn't? But as far as I know, there's no cities or counties in the state of Kansas that would claim to be a sanctuary county. But this really goes back, you know, the horse is out of the barn. The horse is out of the barn uh, when they come across the border. We have to secure the border. Again, I just don't have enough judges. I don't have enough law enforcement officers in the state of Kansas to handle the volume you're talking about. I believe in securing the border. I believe in legal, merit-based immigration. And it's just that simple. Otherwise, we're just chasing our, our tail. Did I miss any of it? No, okay. Thank you. All right. Let's, let's go in the very back, and then we can get you to. What's the problem with the Department of Justice? We're not hearing anything about Biden connections in the Ukraine or China, election fraud, or certain congressmen who have proven uh, relationships with the Chinese Communist Party. What's going on with the Department of Justice? So his question is, what's going on with the, the Department of Justice and frust frustrated that, that some of these investigations aren't coming to a head? I'm just as frustrated as you are. I'm not sure why the wheels of justice take so long. I don't have a good answer for you. Um, one of my frustrations, you know, what can I do, though? Um, we can investigate issues in Congress, just about any issue. We can find a reason to hold a hearing and investigate it. And again, the, the chairman of that committee gets to decide what we're going to talk about, what hearing we're going to have to investigate some of the issues you're talking about. So now we've, we've lost control of the gavel, and we can't, make those do, we can't do that anymore. Um, I'm a little frustrated that before I was in the Senate, I think they kind of burned some daylight and didn't move fast enough. Yes, yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, I, as I look around the room, I just... So his question is: the demographics in the room, and you, you know, if you're not, if you're if you're on Facebook Live, you know, most people are, are my age, but there's some some young ladies here in the room uh, as well, and a few and some young guys as well. So I'm hoping they're on. I'm hoping they're on our face Facebook Lives, where I'm hoping that they're at. I can't t tell right now, but. Katie's going to look, but but people will see this. We may have 200 now, but I bet 2,000 people will look at it in the next week or so. That's typically what we'll see as well. A little over 100. So there's over 100 people on it right now. Um, so, but we have to figure out how to reach them and, and educate them as well. I think education is a big deal. Okay. Yes, yes, sir. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, actually, it ties into what my question was. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit see what your comments are. Um, as a somewhat younger voter, there's a lot of career politicians that have been in office since before I could vote. Yep. So when we talk about um, you know, what do we do to change or to regain the lack of common sense, and the comment was made, vote in those whose values align with our own. As a relatively younger voter, um, you know, I see career politicians that have been in there for 15 and 20 years that I didn't vote for it, but I have no control over them. We see the House and the Senate passing legislation. How do we, how do we as a younger voter, how do we, how do we combat that? What's your, what's your comments on term limits and, and career politicians? So his question is about term limits and career politicians. So uh, within the first week of getting to the House, I signed on to term limits that I would support uh, voting for term limits. But we cannot, cannot have a term limit in Kansas, but not a term limit in California. Because certainly the longer you're in Congress, the more power you have, and the ultimate power is to be a committee chairman, which is typically based upon seniority as, as well. So I'm very much in favor of it. I, I just don't see it happening. And then the career politician or not, I, I, that's why we have elections. Um, I'm, I think that we are seeing a trend towards non-career politicians. The Republican senators that came in with me, you know, a, a football coach, uh, Another young lady that's an agriculture uh, rancher up, up in Wyoming as, as well. Uh, so I, I think that uh, you're going to see a, a, the person from Tennessee was a, an ambassador to Japan for four years under President Trump, but really was a business person. So I think that the voters are voting with their feet, that that seems to be the trend. Yes, ma'am. Senator uh, Cheryl Stevens, thank you for being here. It is special to have you. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for taking care of all your constituents. My sister lives on Social Security, doesn't file income tax. She didn't get her stimulus. She called your office, and it's processing, and I'm sure she probably got it Friday. But I want to thank you for taking care of all your constituents. Okay. 
So her, her, thank you so much. Thank you for thanking me for, I got great staff uh, working on constituent issues. And I, I suppose we work on hundreds of peoples of issues every week. And it, it amazes me that we can't get it right. Mostly it's veterans issues. And I think it's a good time just to remind people. So if you have an issue is to contact our office. I hope you sign up for our newsletter as well. I tried to make it Kansas centric. I think getting good quality objective news is really hard these days. I'm going to do my best to present the, the facts and then you decide what to do with them. Uh, but, but I appreciate it. And, I, and again, I would give my staff all the credit. I, if I've done anything in right, it's hire good people <laughs> as well. Yes, ma'am. Is there any way that you know of to stop uh, Vice President Harris? She's talking about taking all of the veterans' money and giving it to the illegals. The, the money that was supposed to go to the veterans. So your question is, can we stop Vice President Harris from taking money from veterans and giving it to illegal aliens? Um, first time I've heard of that. But, but there are, again, it would be against the law, against the laws we wrote, and I'm sure that the, the veterans organizations would be leading the way to sue, sue her, sue the federal government over that as well. So that's the way we would accomplish it. All right, I think we need to, to wrap it up. I think, I don't know, I don't want to brag, but I bet we covered about as many issues as any politicians <laughs> covered in 45 minutes. Yes, but one more. I just want one question. Okay. I was at the inauguration out of respect and saw him across the across the way. Her question is have I seen have I seen President Biden? But that would have been it as well. Okay. Well I appreciate everybody coming out. And if, if you got one more? Okay. One more. All right. We haven't mentioned taxes. Okay. You know, they're talking corporate taxes. Washington says it's not gonna cost anybody anything. Corporate taxes is the way we're gonna go. Yes, Washington thinks so we really believe that Corporate are going to take the tax increase that needed. They're going to pass it to the consumer. Inflation's going to go crazy. And, you know, there are solutions out there. And, and I know Washington needs money. You know, <laughs> tax loopholes. Yeah. It doesn't seem like anybody ever talks about tax loopholes. All the tax loopholes. You know, not being trying to be for one party or the other and be neutral. You know, our last president, you know, and I like him. You know, they never have figured out if he ever paid taxes, but he did what the legislatures did, presented to him, was loopholes. And he used them. And, you know, people have passed loopholes. And none of that ever seems to get passed. Okay, so uh, comments about about taxes, but you're, you're right. If raising the corporate taxes will be passed on to the consumer, and it's also going to decrease the value of your 401ks as well. I think that that's spot on. What they're also going to do is probably raise dividend taxes and capital gains taxes. And most of us, I mean, many, many, many people live off dividends. So that would go up to your personal rate as well. So there's, it's going to be way more than corporations. They're trying to just say, you know, stay focused on the corporation tax, but there's going to be lots of other hidden taxes in there that they're going to float in there as well. So we need to wrap it up. I need to get to Newton. Thank you for coming. You're welcome. Yeah. I wish you had some more security. Okay, thank you. Thanks, thanks everybody. God bless.